Okay, ladies and gentlemen. If I could um, ask everybody to silence their phones, it would be most appropriate. This is uh, going to be the cover of the fall edition of Directors and Boards. And our um, guest speaker, John Montford, is obviously on the right. And it's um, McCool, what's the first name? Joe McCool. Joe, Joe McCool, who uh, co-authored the book. Um, and they're in front of the Manchester Hotel in what, New Hampshire, I guess? Yes. Collaborating on the rules of engagement in terms of the, uh, we, the book. We look like a couple of cattle rustlers. Well, <laughs> I think that's the picture they wanted. So, yeah, I couldn't get Julie to get the boots in there, but <laughs> we, we, you know that's appropriate. Well, look, we have a great lineup uh, this evening um, with uh, John Monford and um, Alan Alan Crane. Uh, Alan is the uh, senior vice president, uh, chief of legal and governance counsel for uh, Baker Hughes, which I know everybody in Texas is uh, familiar with. He is a sought-after speaker as a NACD board fellow on subjects ranging from corporate governance issues to international corporate relations. His speaking appearances include such pre, uh, prestigious uh, institutions as Stanford University, Rice, the Fletcher, the, um, Fletcher School at Tufts, and the University of Texas. Alan has over 30 years of experience as an arbitrator in both domestic and international cases under the rules of the International Chamber of Congress, uh, Commerce and the American Arbitration Association. He holds degrees in engineering, an MBA, and of course his law degree. John Monfort, I've known John for about 10 years and describe him simply as over accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, here's, and here's what I mean. He's a graduate of the UT Naval ROTC program and UT Law School under US Marine Corps, under the Marine Corps sponsorship and served as a Marine Corps JAG uh, during the turbulent times in, uh, in Vietnam. He's a very experienced prosecutor, having served as the DA at Lubbock. He served as a senator in the Texas State Senate. He's the first chancellor of Texas Tech University. He also has a dam named after him. What, what, what's that like, Henry? <clears throat> Yes. Yeah. Like Alan Henry. Yeah, like Alan it Henry. It didn't have any water in it for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you probably loaned him the uh, bulldozer or whatever. And until recently, he was a special advisor to the chairman of AT&T and then to the chairman of General Motors during the company's restructure. Ha happened to be the same guy. Um, but he did a wonderful job, and now he's an accomplished author. But most, his most significant accomplishment was marrying Debbie. Like we like to say in Texas, he married way up, <laughs> as most of us have done. <clears throat> and um, even though the ceremony, his wedding ceremony, was conducted at the B&B &B Quick Stop in <laughs> Idaloo, Texas, by the <laughs> JP. <laughs> How about that for a lasting marriage, 41 years. And unfortunately, Debbie could not attend because she is a Texas Tech regent and they're having uh, their board meetings this weekend. And um, that's about it. Over to you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Don. I will say this, that marriage at B&B &B Quick Stop has lasted 42 years. Uh, we, were, we were at the governor's mansion one time when I was in the Senate, and they were going around the room, and everybody was, I don't know who brought the subject up, but they, they started talking about, well, where were y'all married? So it went around the room, and guess what? We were last. I mean, we had Highland Park Methodist, First Baptist, First Church of Christ, very prominent Catholic church that got around to us and the governor said, John, where were we all married? I said, well, we're married at B&B &B Quick Stop in Idaloo, Texas. 
and we were trying to keep our marriage out of the newspaper, but that didn't work very well. Okay, well, I want to talk this evening, uh, and, and, and it is an honor to be uh, before this very fine organization, which is so effectively administered. I've been very impressed uh, with the staff work, and you do a tremendous job. I want to talk about boards um, and board service. My, uh, our publisher for the book has a sense of humor, which I enjoyed, and uh, we were talking the other day, and we, I asked him to give me the list of the, the shortest books in the world. And I want to tell you what they shared with me and see if you've read any of these. The first one, probably the shortest one, is A Lawyer's Guide to Ethical Behavior. <laughs> I saw that on Jimmy Smith's desk the other day. Uh, the second shortest one is the NRA Handbook on Gun Control. There's another one, Career Opportunities for Liberal Arts Majors. That's pretty short. Uh, a real short one is Everything Men Know About Women. <laughs> Gourmet Cooking with Tofu. And the one I, there are two more I really like, Managing Your Personal Ego by Donald Trump. <laughs> and A Politician's Guide to Classified Emails by Hillary Clinton. <laughs> I made that entirely bipartisan. Okay. Let's talk about service on boards in America, and I might get a little philosophical here, but it, I want to set the stage for what we're going to visit about and what is incorporated in this book, and, and uh, certainly looking forward uh, to uh, a dialogue with Alan. Corporate boards are the strategic panels for publicly traded American companies. Charitable and nonprofit boards are the entities that supply many unmet needs in American society. Your board service is a very important part of the way we live, the way we work, the way we give, and the way we earn in this country. In our book, Board Games, uh, which I think most of you have, uh, have a copy of, uh, we, we have focused uh, in the first edition uh, on for-profit boards that are on exchange-listed companies in the United States. If My Marriage Can Endure It, Volume 2 will be about charitable and nonprofit boards and more focus on those important roles that they play. Boards of directors are the governance mechanism for corporations that are free enterprise system drive our free enterprise system. They set company goals. They hire and fire top management. They make sure that companies deliver returns for its shareholders, who are the company's owners. The profit motive drives our way of doing business in this country. It contrasts us dramatically from countries where despots and dictators rule the economy. The profit motive is the lifeblood of our free enterprise system and gives entrepreneurs and businesses the opportunity to excel and capitalize with their ingenuity. Thus, in the for-profit world of American companies, a director's primary responsibility, pure and simple, should be to legally and ethically make money for their shareholders through effective corporate governance. In large part, our democratic society places the means of productions in the hands of privately owned businesses and private individuals, not government. It places confidence in a free market system owned privately by individuals and businesses to prosper and compete. That is not to say that government should not have a necessary role in a free enterprise economy. It has an important regulatory role, leveling the playing field so that entrepreneurs and companies can fairly compete. It is against this backdrop that we find a constant philosophical divide in this country of just how far government should intervene in our system of free enterprise. This becomes an almost daily exchange as we hear it from liberals versus conservatives, Democrats versus Republicans, and states versus the federal government. This continuous back and forth and sometimes contentious dialogue sets the stage on which American companies must operate. 
It is a challenging, divisive, and almost daily legal battle as to just how far the federal government should intervene in the corporate decision-making process, as well as how much control it should exert to maintain a system that is fair to competitors on the one hand and fair to the consuming public on the other. Effective board governance in this regulatory mix master, as I call it, is, is important because boards are an important thread in the fabric of the American economy. And I submit to you there are two critical pivot points in the evolution of board governance in American history that have, that have driven the American economy. The first was the Exchange Act of 1934, which Congress enacted following the infamous October 1929 stock market crash. And secondly, was the Sarbanes-Oxley Act Congress passed in 2002, known affectionately as SOX, which followed episodes like the Enron collapse of the late 1990s. These two monumental pieces of legislation which were mostly reactionary, set forth the perimeters of effective corporate governance board members are responsible for today. Candidly, directors of for-profit companies these days must have a working knowledge of the legal and regulatory mandates of these two acts. This is essential not only for setting directors but also for those who are new directors or those who are about to join corporate boards. There are also two very important private regulatory bodies in addition to the government that govern exchanges where for-profit companies trade their shares. These are, of course, as you know, the New York Stock Exchange, termed NYSE. I pause momentarily every time I hear an ac acronym because one of my pet peeves is too many acronyms. Dependent on which exchange listed companies subscribe to, companies and boards must comply with their regulatory oversight. Setting at the helm of oversight for the operation of American companies and boards is the enforcement and compliance arm of the federal government, which as you know is the Securities and Exchange Commission, or what we call the SEC. In order for publicly traded companies uh, to survive, they must comply with the regulations promulgated by these entities or risk being delisted, which disqualifies them from publicly trading their shares. These days, setting as a member of a publicly traded company board is not, I repeat, is not for the faint of heart. There are governance requirements in place that are so fundamental that their application must have the board and management's full attention. For example, today a board of directors for a listed company must consist of a majority of independent directors, directors who have no affiliation or association with management. Thus, for example, they cannot occupy a management role, they cannot derive any compensation from the company as a general rule except for their service on the board of directors. And even more fundamental is that the three committees required by law, nominating and governance, compensation, and audit, must all consist of a majority of independent directors, or in the case of the audit committee, entirely of independent directors. So in our book, Board Games, A Guide for New Directors and Good Governance, we try to tackle the tough leadership challenges directors face these days for effective corporate governance. We discuss a variety of topics that we hope are beneficial to new and setting directors, but also those people who aspire to serve on boards. We begin with chapter one, which is featured in the magazine uh, that you saw the cover, and that is how to get on a board if your name is not a household word. I think that that's question I'm asked more than any other question is, how do I get on a board if I'm not a celebrity or not a national prominent figure? It can be done. We highlight throughout the book for directors not to leave their common sense at the door and have several real life experiences we write about to demonstrate our points. We tackle the concept of director independence head on 
and highlight a director's fiduciary responsibilities to their shareholders as well as the public as large. We stress the need to understand corporate finance and discuss in real terms what is represented on a balance sheet. Another chapter deals with crisis management, which we all face in our careers at one time or another, particularly as directors, and that chapter is entitled, When Bad Things Happen to Good Boards. We tackle head-on the issue of the feasibility of whether or not the CEO should serve as chair of the board, and we stress the crucial importance of careful succession planning. A lengthy chapter is devoted to the functions of the audit committee, appropriately characterized as the board's fire department. We write a lot about executive compensation, pointing out candidly to many instances where it gets out of hand. We dwell on the existential threat of malware to cybersecurity, a new and growing challenge that directors must face now. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, we dwell on leadership, the leadership that boards need today. We also include what we hope are some useful appendices on acronyms, board self-evaluations, and a sample corporate balance sheet. And I would be remiss if I did not mention two new issues that have arisen that emerged after we submitted the manuscript, and these are proxy access and term limits for directors. These are largely a product of shareholder activism and have been pushed by ISS, Institutional Shareholders Services. Proxy access is a procedure that gives shareholders a more direct voice in corporate board elections. It provides a procedure by which shareholders can place their own nominees for directors on a company's proxy sheet. And term limits for directors dictate the length of stay directors may serve on listed company boards. We hope this book will serve as a useful guide for the challenges and opportunities that occur with board ser service in our free enterprise economy. If you are privileged to be selected for a board, whether public or private, profit or nonprofit, charitable or governmental, your role is, and your election to the board, is a fulfillment of the American dream. It is serious and essential participation in our American economy, and for your service, you are to be commended. I will now ask our program moderator, Alan Crane, to my left, to engage in a fireside chat, and then I will tender myself for unrestricted, unlimited cross-examination. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, John, it's a great pleasure to be with you in person in front of our audience. I, I have a great advantage over, I'm sure, most of you in that I've read and reread John's book. In fact, if I show you the one under here, it's bleeding yellow because I highlight everything, and there's a lot to highlight. It's a great book. You all have done a great job. Provide us with something very useful. You mentioned the um, Securities Exchange Act of 34, the Sarbanes-Oxley in 2002, and we've talked about Dodd-Frank together before this program, and, and that they are reactive, and they impose lots of things on companies and boards. So you've been on the Fleetwood Industries board for 10 years. You've been on the Southwest Airlines board for since 2002, I think. Right. So what can the board do to get ahead of issues like that? How do you make sure your board's a board that deals with the issues so that you don't become the Enron, WorldCom, Adelphia, Tyco, and now Wells Fargo, Volkswagen, Samsung, or whomever? What, what yeah. can a board do to avoid those kind of problems? We don't have enough time for that one. <laughs> I, I did a piece the other day, there were 15 takeaways for my, my board service, and the first, was one, the first takeaway was you have to double check the math on management's financials. There, there are a lot of complexities in this business of being on a board, and I, I think, I, I really believe that leadership is the key. I think you have to have directors who are engaged who are successful in their own right, and really have a, sort of a sixth sense to detect issues and problems. Because 
uh, you know, I cannot tell you how many times, I mean, it's, it's amazing to me, for instance, in the boards I've served on, no matter how good you are to the employees, there's always going to be somebody trying to game the system. So I, I think it is sort of a sixth sense that a lot of business people develop and have that you, you know when something is just not right and you, you tend to, to stay engaged. I'm not for micromanaging uh, in, in the board's capacity. And I, I also say that boards, uh, as a rule, should not, uh, shouldn't do press quotes or press interviews. That's not in your job description. But I do think you have to stay engaged and, and, and keep abreast of what's going on in a company, uh, not just during board meetings. You've got to stay abreast. And there's plenty of conduits. There's plenty of access of information out there. So I would say, you know, stay engaged, keep informed, and then exercise strong leadership prerogatives when you think there's a problem. Uh, to me, those are some of the soft skills you have to possess to be an effective director. So the, um, you, you mentioned independence also, and your book does a very good job addressing independence. So when you think about independence, and there are rules, whether they're NYSE rules or SEC rules, but on a soft skill basis, on a relationship basis, what do you really think about in terms of independence? What do you want to see between the board and the CEO in particular? in terms of the kind of relationship? It gets really complicated when your CEO is chair of the board. Uh, that can have, as we sort of articulate the arguments for and against that in the book. I think, I don't think you have to approach management like you would a lawyer would try to deal with a federal judge. I mean, the judge is not going to fraternize with the attorneys. They, they do keep, uh, certainly they have a lot of ethics to abide by. But I do think, in terms of your relationship with management, uh, I think you use the word as uh, CEO co-opting. Uh, CEO capture, or yeah, board, CEO, board, capture, board yeah. capture by the CEO, yeah. Yeah, when you and I, I were talking. I, I think that what I've always tried to push, well, in the first place, if, if a company is working well and you're making a profit um, le legally and ethically, I don't see a need to go in and shake things up, but I do see a need to keep an arm's length in your relationship with management. I would be cautious about going on vacations with the CEO and little, little things like that that are going to put you in a box if you come to the point you're going to have to really make a decision to exercise your independence that's going to go against the grain or going to go against management's wishes. So again, it boils down to common sense. Uh, but I've had fellow directors that I thought were getting a little too cozy with the CEO, and I don't mind telling them that. And certainly when you have an issue, uh, I, I can, count, I can uh, enumerate countless times where you have to go against management. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's important to maintain your independence. And you made a reference when you were speaking earlier about proxy access, and that is sort of the significant issue being brought to I many think, boards? I think it is a disaster waiting to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you why. If your company has 10 institutional investors, let's say, and they all want to put forth a slate of directors, uh, you know, I guess majority vote will win. But I, I think I do see some problems with companies competing with each other to try to put their person, their representatives on the board, particularly when you have a number of institutional investors. Uh, most of companies now, in terms of dealing with proxy access, are, are coming down to allowing uh, or requiring a, a, a percentage threshold for eligibility, and then they will limit it to either 20% or two, two, uh, two directors uh, on the board, and then it's majority vote wins. So I think you're seeing companies adjust to this pressure. I've always felt that ISIS, ISS, Institutional Shareholder Services, and if anybody's affiliated with them in the audience, I'm sorry. I think it's a guy. First time I heard him called ISIS. But well, okay. well, that was, that some was of, a some slip. Of, some of us understand that. We understand that, John. Well, I still think it's a guy somewhere in a room in a basement with a little green visor thinking up all this stuff. But I, that's I, my opinion. <laughs> I spoke on a program out in California a number of years ago when they were really gaining their strength. 
and he spoke about how, how they looked forward to going public, and we all thought, we really look forward to you going public, too, <laughs> which you'll notice they never really did in the full sense to be subject to it. Well, let me come back to an area in your book that you didn't, you just made a brief reference to in your prepared remarks, and that's cybersecurity, because I think you all do a great job addressing how important, well, it's, an, it's an existential risk for a board. Yes. And, and do companies and boards really understand that because I have a bachelor's and master's in engineering, I like all things technical, but I don't know if we're spending enough on the boards I've served on to handle this, or are we spending too much, or are we spending it in the right place? It's a very challenging <clears throat> issue, and it is existential. So, so give us yeah. more color on that. W would you be an underwriter for an insurer that was going to cover cybersecurity? I wouldn't. <laughs> I think that's, that's a real uh, interesting phenomenon. It, it, is, it has sort of evolved the last 20 years, and uh, I know companies I've been affiliated with, we get literally thousands of hits, sometimes weekly. I mean, it's, it's, an, it's phenomenal. A lot of them are coming from overseas. Um, I don't know of any board that's really, uh, the, all the directors I've talked to, I don't know anybody really feels good about this. I think it is a continuous threat. And uh, I, I'm big on getting second opinions. I, uh, I think we put, in the companies I've been affiliated with, at least we think we put top flight people in the, in the IT management. Uh, that's internet technology. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm a firm believer in getting second opinions. And there, there are a lot of experts out there but it's hard to find really qualified ones in my view. And uh, so uh, I, I tend to favor expert second opinions and we do a lot of auditing in the cyber security malware problem areas. Well, as you know, and I think was referenced so at Baker Hughes, I have most all of the risk-oriented activities, the legal, the compliance, the, the risk enterprise or, risk management, yeah. the insurance, yeah. security, and we've divided it up so that security sets the um, standards. IT has to meet those standards. And then we use internal audit to audit those standards, as many other things. And you, and you do a great job in your book addressing both the relationship with internal audit and external audit in the board. Can you give us a little taste well, of what that's like? I, I'm a firm believer in both, and they're expensive. Sarbanes-Oxley has exacerbated the cost of accounting fees for uh, American companies, and, and without being judgmental, I think in the book I kind of say that it may have been an overreaction. But, um, you know, you know uh, I believe that you, you look at your internal audit staff as sort of an internal financial police force, and they, they uh, have uh, an awesome responsibility <laughs> Uh, when we talk about fraud, waste, uh, IT, cybersecurity, all of these components. Uh, so you, you are directly responsible in the audit committee for uh, their supervision and certainly ensuring that they have the assets and resources necessary to do their job. But I also feel the same uh, uh, enthusiasm about having a strong uh, independent in external audit or independent auditors uh, that come in and take a second look. And these things are expensive. And I, I tell you, um, I, I, I agonize over accounting bills uh, because as chair of the audit committee, I get to review them. Uh, but I, I think it is a necessary product not only of the evolution of cyber threats, the extensive uh, invasions of malware, but also in terms of the risk management and financial controls you have to put in place now. So they're both vitally important, I think, to the proper functioning and proper governance uh, that boards have to exercise. As you note, a fundamental responsibility of the audit committee. So you've noticed people are bringing um, written questions up, and I will ask those of John, so if you have a question, please, there's cards on the... Uh, tables, and we want this to be interactive. We'll spend some more time maybe taking questions from the audience at the very end if we have time. Although John and I can't see you because these lights are really incredibly bright. <laughs> Good. I got them to laugh. We know they're still there at uh, least. Uh, so, at least we won't know who's asking us the question. <laughs> <that's true. laughs> so talking, as you did on your prepared remarks, about keeping your hand on the pulse, 
how do you do that beyond the CEO? As, as you know, we've discussed, I've spoken at different forums about asymmetric information risk. And we talk about that, and I know you've been to the NACD programs, you may have heard me talk about that in Washington or in New York, where the board, I like to call it the, the photo versus the movie theory, which we've discussed. If you're part of management, you live the movie 24 hours a day, seven days a week with all the crashes, the sounds, the feels, the temperatures, the smells, whatever. And then those of us on the boards, when we come to board meetings, management, even the best thinking management, best intention management, presents us with just a set of photographs to try and give us a sense of what's going on. And if you don't have a management that's well-intentioned, those photographs, which are really PowerPoints nowadays, are biased. But there's a bias even if you don't want to be. How do you, how do you overcome that? How do you, do you get to know other officers? Do you get to know, what do you do? It causes you ulcers, I mean. <laughs> uh, you suffer. There, there is, you know, I don't like to micromanage the operation. I don't think that's my job. I think we lay out as a board the strategic plan and we, we make sure that management executes. But let me tell you, these days with board service, particularly in the audit committee role, I say I put in 40 hours a month. I don't put in 40 hours a week. But I literally make on-site visits weekly. I read everything I can get my hands on in the press or internal documents that I can access about what's going on in the company. And I, I think as a director, you have that responsibility. It is basically a, a double check on what management presents you. If you just show up at board meetings and collect a check, it is time for a retirement party. <laughs> I think uh, it's a lot, it, it has now become a, almost a full-time job. So you have to balance the, the uh, temptation to micromanage versus keeping yourself well informed as a director. But you know, these days, it, I, I rest my case, the, if you have a, a, a cyber security problem, if you have a, 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 a hacking, as they call it, uh, the results can be uh, financially catastrophic. So you just can't live in a vacuum as a director anymore. It is more intense. It is more, requires more engagement. And really, you, you've just got to double up your efforts to keep informed about how a company's doing. So how, how about the, um, you talk a good deal in your book, and it's a great discussion, particularly at the end. You have uh, a listing of some soft skills. Talk about diversity in the broadest sense and how you see that for the board. What do you want to see in terms of, when you say diversity about board members, what are you thinking? Well, I, th I think the first place for boards these days uh, to be effective competitively to compete, you, you really need to sort of be a mirror of the constituency you serve. And I think that the old days of cronyisms on boards of picking your buddy or your friend as a director <laughs> Hopefully those are behind us now. I, I think boards that are engaged these days are sensitive to diversity. I think they're sensitive to their geographic reach. And I think they're sensitive to wanting successful people, wanting to recruit successful people on the boards. So it's kind of all of the above. You have to be effective in your governance role. And I have found, uh, uh, frankly, I, I'm pretty biased towards women uh, on boards. Does this have anything to do? Oh, it has to do with boards, <laughs> well, okay. When you I first mean, said that, I wasn't sure. <laughs> I, I, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're a little bit more philosophical. They get down on the details. <laughs> and and uh, I've, I've really enjoyed serving on my more diverse boards. I think the last three directors we picked up on Southwest board with a, a, a really an incredible list of qualified applicants, but I believe the last two or three have been uh, women that, that came on the board, and they make really good board members. I guess that's a generalization, but I'm sticking by my word. Good. And, and, and Besides, I, I'd rather hang out with girls anyway. Yeah, I, I knew that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and how about, to, to dig a little deeper, because we actually have a question from one of our audience members about diversity of experience. Are you looking for different backgrounds or you a want people from the industry? Yeah. What do you, oh, what do you of want? Of course you are. Uh, 
You know, I, I said in one of my takeaways, uh, no offense to the accountants, but I said Shakespeare got it wrong in Henry VI. They should have killed all the accountants, not the lawyers. Uh, and the reason I say that is we get in this incessant dialogue about gap versus non-gap accounting. And I, it's become a convenience item, you know. They, they're pretty clever about using non-GAAP when they want to get a raise. So, <laughs> so uh, I, I am I've mystified by all of this GAAP versus non-GAAP <laughs> argument. And, and so I think the accountants have kind of done a pretty good job of, uh, of, of uh, designing a system that they can manipulate. Gosh, I hope I'm not quoted in the press on some of this stuff. <laughs> but it, that's the way I feel. I just, I get real frustrated with the gap versus non-gap situations. But uh, again, uh, I think you look for successful, qualified people. You look for diversity. You look for people that bring something to the mix, bring something to the table, bring something that you need. Um, I can give you examples. When we were going into Mexico uh, on one board I was on, we wanted somebody from the area who w uh, knew the politics, uh, knew the players, knew the corporate uh, behavior, all of these things, all of the above. So um, I think diversity is important. I think you look for successful, qualified people who bring something to the mix. And goodness knows, I think it'd be terrible to have a board that was all lawyers or all accountants. I mean, you've got to have a more diverse approach. Right. You made reference uh, about the separation between chairman and CEO. Um, Wells Fargo now thinks that's a good idea to separate those roles. <laughs> but, but, but give us your reasons why, why you see that to be true. Well, in, in the book, uh, my co-author and I get into pretty pretty philosophical argument, I guess you'd say, about the pros and cons. I, I'm a, enough of a conservative, I guess, from a business standpoint to say that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I have found... Uh, you know, when Herb Kelleher was chair of uh, Southwest Board before he retired, our meetings lasted a few hours. <laughs> uh, now they last a whole week. Uh, but, uh, and he, he was, he was really, is it one of the smartest, not just because he wrote the forward to the book, but he's one of the smartest people I've ever known. And, and he was an extremely effective, as is Gary Kelly, an extremely effective CEO. So. They, they both have said as chairman of the Southwest Board, and I think it works fine. Uh, but it doesn't work fine in every situation. I think you have to, to maintain your independence, and if you don't think it's a good idea and you're on a board, you need to separate those roles. But we know that um, the business judgment rule covers the decisions we make as board members so long as it's not a conflict of interest and so long as you're informed. So you, you talk about two very different um, styles of, C of CEOs and, and board chairs. How do you make sure you get informed to the level that you're comfortable you're meeting your fiduciary duty as a board member? We've talked some about that already. But well, uh, I can tell you I this. Uh, I've had several knockdown drag outs with a CEO and we disagree. I usually prefer to go in and shut the door and scream at him. Um, <laughs> and tell him he's wrong or she's wrong. Uh, I, I just think that that's part of being your, part of your role as an independent director. We, I've been on boards where we really got into it. I was in, insistent that we have, have a more meaningful dividend. When you have corporations that are generating billions of dollars, you cannot forsake your owners. So I go in and I make my case and I think I've been successful on two out of three. And um, but I think you just, you cannot forsake your independence as a director if your chairman is your CEO. You, it just won't work. So you gotta go speak your mind. And uh, you know, there, there have been contentious episodes, but I feel like uh, a conscientious director will retain his or her independence. And that helps you get the information you need by being very candid with the CEO. But yeah, we're and, talking and about I, slamming the door and so you're, you're alone with them. You look to not embarrass them in front of the rest of the board, but so you maintain that relationship. Well, I've done that too. I mean, I, <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, you know, we've had some knockdown drag outs in the open sessions. But again, at the end of the day, I mean, it's kind of like 
I guess, running a football team, you, when you hit the field, you try to present a united front. Let's talk about a couple other areas that you made reference to and I know you have thoughts on. In fact, I'm not sure there's an area John doesn't have an opinion on, and that's a good <laughs> thing, because that means he's informed about all these things. So term limits for, mm -hmm. for directors. We've talked about getting a diverse board, getting a board that has soft skills, ability to know what's going on. Do you yeah. think we need term limits? <clears throat> Well, I don't want to talk myself out of a job. Um, and I, I look at this the same way I did political term limits. I served 14 years in the Senate, and candidly, probably two years too many. I probably, I think 12 is a pretty good number. But when you have directors who build up this vast um, amount of institutional knowledge uh, that you cannot get overnight, Similarly, in the legislative process, I mean, you've got to learn how to work the system. Uh, so I don't know that a mechanical number is, you know, an arbitrary number like 12 or 14 is, a, is the right way to go. I think you have to individualize it, but as many people have said, you know, if it's a democratic election process, there's your term limit. And I think now you find with the shareholder activism, uh, most of the boards I'm on, you have to get reelected every year, and the, uh, the institutional investors will flex their muscle if they don't think you're doing a good job. And then I also think, as a director, it's incumbent upon you to, if someone is not performing, and you'll know it, I think it's time y'all had a chat about a retirement party. I think it's incumbent on you as a director. So, so how do you make that? So I guess you could say I'm against term limits, but I'll live <laughs> with them if we have to. Because yeah. you can't. Because you have to have that hard discussion. Oh yeah, it's, it's hard yeah. to come up and say. But I, I would or, hate to say, for instance, look at Herb Kelleher when he was CEO. I mean, uh, he. I think he stepped down at at 75, and uh, he was a phenomenal brilliant leader. I, I just don't think it should be a mechanical, arbitrary decision that you cap it at a certain number of years. Yeah. So you mentioned you know, annual elections, and that's, that is certainly a wave that's gone for years, taking out the staggered boards. But you also mentioned maintaining that knowledge base that people have. Do you think annual elections are a good thing? Do no, I didn't. <laughs> I was the only director that voted against them. I thought I thought the institutional investors were going to hammer me on the proxy, but they didn't. I just felt like uh, one-year terms are too short. I mean, I, the, the amount of information, I mean, you all know running your businesses, um, and those of you who serve on boards, you can't, if you're, one year is just not enough to learn the intricacies of modern corporate uh, businesses. So I... I went. I mean, I got outvoted on that one, so we're elected once a year. But uh, normally, I think I think if a company's performing legally and ethically, you're going to get reelected. But if if something's going wrong, you have institutional investors that are getting nervous about something. Then you then you you could have conceivably have some problems. So how about staying on the subject of valuation by the board of itself and performance? What do you think works best on that? Because that's, that's a touchy thing. It's a hard thing. <clears throat> well, I, I believe, uh, and in the book, we put a, put a self board self-valuation form in the appendix. It's sort of globally used now. Uh, I think two things. Number one, I, would, I, I think these evaluations have to be uh, anonymous in the sense that if I want to say something about a certain director, I don't want to have to be confronted over coffee with what I'm saying. So the way you do this is you, you give your board these questionnaires about self-evaluation. Let them fill them out and generally submit them to the general counsel and let the general counsel go through them. And uh, you, you, know, you pretty much know who's criticizing you anyway, but you, you, it's not a business for thin skins. So I, I think it works rather well, and, and I, I think if it, is, if it is done right, if you have a conscientious, uh, conscious, conscientious board, they will write what they think in the questionnaire, turn it into the general counsel, have that general counsel report back to the board saying, you know, we've had criticisms about this particular area, or we need to do more in this particular area. I think that's very constructive. 
So I, I'm very supportive of board self-evaluations. So self-evaluations. And, and, and if you keep them anonymous, if I don't like you and you're a fellow director, maybe you won't find out about it immediately, but you'll probably know eventually who wrote the bad thing about you. So I'm, John, I think if you didn't like me, I'd know in about six or seven seconds. I'm just guessing that. Do what now? I'd know in about six or seven seconds. Oh. I don't think you're very <laughs> no. transparent. I'm not that hard to get and, along and, with. And, 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 <laughs> not imply, I am. I'm not implying you are. So the, the, um, maybe the general counsel, maybe a lead director, maybe the chairman of the board. Depends on the dynamics, I yeah. assume, of the board. Uh, yeah, you can specify. I, I think the general counsel being a component of management, uh, I, 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 would, I tend to keep it out of the inner circle of the board or let somebody that's not technically on the board uh, do the evaluation summaries. Summaries and then destroy all the evidence later. Yeah, well, <laughs> okay. I don't, two words I don't like to use are destroy and fix. <laughs> 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 Particularly in the legislature. Yeah, that's, 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 that creates another kind of turmoil. Let's, let's take, we can take questions from us, but let me ask you one, one more thing, because you, you cover it so well in the book, I made reference to it before. Are the soft skills that make a board, as you say in the book, where you take two directors and the one plus one can equal three, what, what are the types of soft skills that you have found make directors more effective as a group? Well, I think you, you, know, you look for success, I, I mean, um, I always liked to, I hate to, I was a Marine, but I hate to admit it, the Army had a good commercial, be the, be the best that you can be at what you do. Uh, I think you look for successful people. I think you look for people who are engaging, and you look for people who can be team members. Now, you don't always disagree, uh, and I have found that the worst thing, I, well, there are a couple of things that, that you never want to do. One is quit when the going gets tough. And the other is that some directors that I have served with are part of the problem, but never part of the solution. And I found that to be entirely disruptive. So you want people who are, quote, team players, but retain their independence. The soft skills being, can they engage with other board members in a meaningful dialogue and, and, and try to be civil about it? Do they, are, do they, are they successful in their own right? And, and are they the kind of people you want to associate with? And I, I think uh, you know it when you see it. Great. So do we, was anybody too shy to, to write? I want, a, I want write the a, audience to know, now, let me, I want the audience to know that I am an optimist. And I'll tell you how I became an optimist. I, I was, when I was running for the Senate in West Texas, uh, a door to door was, uh, you know, a couple of miles. Um, <laughs> And I went out in the country, I had been district attorney, I went out in the country, this is a true story, I may embellish it a little bit. <laughs> I went up to this house, I knocked on the door, I said, ma'am, I'm, lady came to the door, I said, ma'am, I'm John Monford, and I'm running for the Texas Senate. And I would keep a record of how I thought everybody's gonna vote. And she looked at me and said, I wouldn't vote for you if you were running unopposed. <laughs> She said, you sent my husband to the penitentiary while you were DA. What do you expect me to do? Get off my property and never come back? I marked her as doubtful. <laughs> anyway, but I'm an optimist. <laughs> uh, I love it. So if you want the opportunity to ask John a question directly, we do have people with microphones. So if you raise your hand for them to see you, because we can't see you literally. This is a very shy crowd, even when they're anonymous. Okay, we've, we've got one here, but, oh, sorry, Dave. Okay, we, 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 we asked about staggered annual elections. Well, I preferred the three-year staggered, candidly, but I got out and voted. And, and I think most companies now that sort of bow down to ISS, not ISS, <laughs> ISS pressures <laughs> are going to go to annual elections. I thought, I thought three-year staggered terms were better because of the institutional knowledge that directors needed to have. But that's, that's history now, so we move on. So I've got a couple questions, since we're not getting any others from the audience, um, that go to your next book, but advice for um, nonprofit boards. What, what, what's the difference? Uh, nonprofits and things 
succinctly that you could think of that you want to emphasize? Well, well, from a regulatory standpoint, there are a lot of differences in serving on charitable and nonprofit boards, but I'm pretty keen on them because uh, I think charitable and nonprofit boards fill a void in society that government either cannot or should not uh, engage. And I think they're extremely critical to our way of life in this country. And the other point I want to make about charitable nonprofit boards, and I think we put it in the book, is uh, if you're on a charitable and nonprofit board and you're, you're going to serve with other directors, they're going to be important people on that board uh, as that people that want to serve in a charitable nonprofit capacity. I've seen a lot of directors that really made their their mark on a charitable and nonprofit that will get picked up for a for-profit board simply because they had a record of exemplary service on a charitable and nonprofit board. We are, we are talking about writing volume two that focuses entirely on the uh, uh, governance of charitable and nonprofit boards. I don't know whether my marriage can survive another book, <laughs> but we may do it. <laughs> I don't know, but I, I think it is so vitally important in our country that we have viable charitable and nonprofit boards and that we support them uh, because they, they do a huge service to our country and to our people. And uh, I think in many respects they're just as important. Service on charitable and nonprofits, government boards, uh, I think just as important as for-profit service. So let, let's end around, oh, we've got one? No, oh, and let, let, let us, because we're recording, somebody's gonna bring you a microphone there as they attempt to traverse their way through a sea of people. ISS and Glass Lewis both uh, recommend 75 as an age limit. How do you feel about age limits on board service? Well, uh, I feel a lot less enthusiastic about age limits than I used to. <laughs> you know, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, I, you know, it used to be when we were growing up, I mean, my goodness, when I was growing up, if you were 65, you had one foot in the box, you know? <laughs> and uh, that reminds me of another story, but I'll defer that. <clears throat> um, I, I don't like arbitrary numbers, but I think statistically, you know, you, your mental acuity does probably diminish with somewhat, sometimes with age. So I don't know. I, I just think you need to individualize those decisions, and I, you know, I, I don't have any argument against uh, 75. That may be a good, a good benchmark. But I, I, mean, I have known a lot of talented directors that we have actually extended their term because they were so essential to the operation and governance of a company. So we extended them individually beyond 75. So my views are softening <laughs> on age limits, but uh, it, you know you know it when you see it. I think it is incumbent on you as a director, if you don't feel like you have the mental agility to serve, it's time to have a retirement party. So we're going to seek to close in about two minutes, unless we have another question in the back. I think I can see a hand waving, a shadow at least. John, what do you think about committees? Hang on. <laughs> Why don't you well, ask that again so I'll be on the record? I'm setting you up. What okay. do you think about committees? <laughs> well, you, you can have too many committees, and I had a lot of fun with that story in the book. Uh, when I was chancellor, I arrived at Tech, and uh, they had, in 1993, the Texas Tech has this mascot called the Mask Rider, and it looks like Zorro. It's a rather significant college mascot. In 1993, the saddle, the cinch on the saddle got loose and it turned upside down. The horse threw the rider off and ran up the ramp and killed itself. So the president, being a, an animal rights activist, um, banned the running of the horse. So when I got to Tech uh, several years later, uh, I was uh, getting urged by alums and by faculty, by, certainly by students, uh, to let the horse run again, and the board was for it. So I went before, believe it or not, they had a committee called the Committee for the Mask Rider. <laughs> <laughs> So I go before the committee, 
and I present my case. I said, you know, let's let the horse at least lead the team out on the field. It had also, they had had an issue. It ran over an SMU cheerleader one year. <laughs> <laughs> that cost $77,000 to settle. Uh, <clears throat> Anyway, I was sensitive to all these things. I said, let's let the horse run out on the field and, and lead the team out. And, and they said, oh, well, we'll consider your request. They went in executive session. There were about 20 members of this committee. And the, the chair comes out and says, well, Chancellor, I'm sorry we voted in executive session that the horse cannot run. And I said, well, I'm damn sorry this committee is dissolved. <laughs> Well, that's what I thought of that committee. <laughs> but you can have too many committees. But uh, in, a, in a world of corporate governance, uh, obviously committees are very important. And we get in a lot of philosophical arguments. For instance, uh, we've created special committees. I think a board these days must very seriously address whether or not they should have a separate committee for cybersecurity. I think that's... That's an active debate. So you can have too many committees, yes, but certainly you have to have those necessary for good corporate governance. So John, let me ask you one final question, because in your book and in our discussions together proceeding tonight, uh, we both agreed people make it happen. People make it happen. How often do you want to have the board talking about who's the CEO now, what kind of CEO do we need in the future? Well. Succession planning is hugely important, and you always get the hypothetical of what if your CEO goes out, CEO goes out tomorrow and gets run over by a truck, who's going to take his or her place? Uh, this is a needed continuous dialogue, and if you don't have bench strength in a company, you better get it because things happen. And I've seen it time and time again, unexpected things can happen. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I actually thought I had one of those Wells Fargo bogus accounts. <laughs> I could I thought, where did this come from? I mean, but anyway, those things happen. And so I think you have to concentrate on having adequate, qualified bench strength. And if you don't, you better go get it. John, thank you. This okay, has been a great honor. Thank you. Thank you.